I would invite you to turn this morning as you're seated in your own copy of God's Word or in the Pew Bible in front of you or chair Bible, I guess, in front of you to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 as we return to our series uh, in Acts, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Uh, as you turn to this morning, I want to remind you that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And this is what Jesus means. Those who make peace, that is real peace, not, not a stalemate, not a ceasefire, not a pretend peace, where everyone is pretending they're at peace, but they're really not, uh, what many of us call Christmas dinner. It's a joke. Um, no, no, those who make real peace, Jesus says, will be blessed with the gift of having your name and Jesus' name linked in the minds of your neighbors. And in Acts, Jesus' words come to pass. In Acts chapter 11, which I think we'll get to in a couple of weeks here, uh, we'll see that because of the peace that Jesus' disciples made between two clashing groups in Antioch, groups that are actually in our text this morning, they were first given the name Christian, which means like Christ, like the Messiah, like the Son of God. They were called the sons of God because they made peace like Jesus, the Son of God. They were called Christians because they made peace like Christ makes peace. And so what Acts shows us is that Jesus' words, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, that is not a theoretical blessing. That's not a wish. It's not a dream. This is a goal that is achievable, and it's a blessing that we can enter into today as God's people. Uh, My friends, don't we want this to be true for us here at Grace? Don't we want to be so consistently able to make peace among ourselves and even among our neighbors that everyone around us says, those people are like Jesus? Uh, If that's you this morning, pay attention because our passage today is going to teach us some ways that we can actually enter into Jesus' words, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. So let's read our passage, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. We'll move through it under three points. These are super clever. The first two are, the last one's not. Uh, Broken bridges, bridge builders, and then bridge expanders. That should be more like bridge reinforcers. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Uh, But those are our point titles this morning. Uh, Let's hear Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll reflect on this together. Let's give our attention to God's word. Acts chapter 6. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers... Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch, These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This father reading of what can only be God's own word. Let's pray together. Father, as we reflect on this word this morning, uh, we want it to change our hearts We want it to expand them and to grow them and to transform them more and more into the image of Christ. But we know, Lord, that unless your spirit blesses that word to us, uh, it will not accomplish this task. And so, Lord, we pray that your spirit um, will give us faith, that you would give us ears to hear your word, uh, minds to understand your word, hearts to believe your word. Father, may the words of my mouth as your preacher, and may the meditation of all our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word. May it all now be pleasing in your sight, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We're told at the beginning that this conflict happens as the church is experiencing rapid expansion. And as we've been seeing, uh, the church by this point has thousands and thousands of members. 
And as happens during times of expansion, when people are joining a, a new church, particularly a, a very large church like what we have in, the, in Jerusalem during this time, uh, they naturally connect with people who are like them. And that isn't necessarily because of, of bigotry or animosity or even clickishness. It's not necessarily anything negative. It's often simply because we have a natural affinity, a natural attraction to people who are like us. When we meet people who are, who are like us, who talk like us, who have similar experiences, similar language and culture, it makes the bridges of relationship easier to build and it makes them easier to cross. Uh, that's why when country folk move to the city, they naturally connect with other country folk. It's why when city folk like myself move to the country, they have natural connections to city folk. Uh, the same is true of Southerners and Midwesterners. It's true of Democrats, it's true of Republicans. The fact just is, Relationships are easier with people who are like you, and they are harder with people who are not like you. But Jesus is not building an easy community. That is not the church Jesus is building. He's not building a community of Democrats. He's not building a community of Republicans. He's not building a community of city people or country people or a community of Americans or Europeans or Africans or Mexicans. He is building a community made up of every tribe, tongue, and nation. He is building a people, as we've seen in Acts so far, that is drawing from the Roman elites, from Herod's own household, all the way down to homeless Hebrews in Israel. And he's teaching them and he's teaching us how to live as the family of God on earth, as disciples of Jesus. He's, he's teaching us how to be one people who worship the one God together by the one faith in the one Savior, Jesus. Now those lessons, how to be united in all of that diversity, that's not so easy to learn. And then with, within that, the bridges of unity that get built up can very quickly become cracked and broken. And that's what we see happening here between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. Uh, so the Hellenists and the Hebrews are uh, Jewish groups. Combined, they most definitely made up a majority of the church at this particular time. And they shared a lot in common. As I said, they're both Jewish. They both share a long, wonderful history of loyalty to Jesus as Israelites. Both groups have very similar theological beliefs. They have very similar religious practices, similar Sabbath practices, similar devotional practices, similar weight is given to Sabbath practices and devotion practices. So, so with all that, why the different names? Hellenists were Jews who were born outside of the land of Israel. So they come from Jewish communities in places like Egypt, Rome and Greece. They spoke Greek as their first language, hence the name Hellenist, which means Greek speaking. Uh, and their culture was first shaped by communities outside of the land of Israel. They were Corinthian Jews, Roman Jews, Ephesian Jews. They were not Israeli Jews. And when they moved to the land of Egypt for a variety of reasons, they were not native to that land or native to that culture. The Hebrews were. They were Jews who were born in the land of Israel. Hebrew was their first language, hence the name Hebrews, and their culture was Israeli culture. That is, it was the culture of the land of Israel at that particular time. So it might actually help us to think about these groups a bit like our grouping of Northern Americans and Southern Americans, North and South, right? Southern Americans from Texas and Northern Americans from New York have a lot in common. But they also have enough cultural differences and even language differences that make bridge building between them harder than you might expect if you were standing outside of our American cultural context. And so that's what happens here, is that the Jew Jewish Christians from outside Israel, the Hellenists, because of similar language and culture, they have become one group in the church, and the Hebrew Jewish Christians have become another group in the church. Now, they're not at war with each other. Uh, they don't hate each other. The text doesn't seem to indicate that at all. But there's some distance from each other. There's some ignorance about each other. Their, their relationship between them just isn't 
very deep. In fact, the relational bridges between each other, they appear to be quite fragile. And because of that, it's very easy for them to become suspicious of each other. And you can see that ignorance from Luke's comment in verse 1 that the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, the daily distribution was the daily handout of food that the church gave to those who needed it so that they wouldn't starve. This is literally their daily bread. So this is a big deal. This is not arguments over the color of the carpet. This is literally whether or not someone has food to eat that day. And so these widows, these older women who at this time in history are very vulnerable to poverty, they're very vulnerable to starvation, they are not getting the food that they needed to survive each day. Now, why are they not getting it? Well, Luke says it's because they're being neglected. Now, that word for neglect is normally used when someone makes a mistake. It's not intentional. It's not full of hatred. Instead of neglect, you could also translate this word as simply overlooked. They're just not being seen. They're being passed over in the gaze of those who are in charge. And so what Luke is telling us is that these widows weren't being neglected out of spite. They weren't being neglected out of hatred. They weren't being neglected out of xenophobia, which is a fear of other countries and, and cultures. Uh, it wasn't hatred. It wasn't racism. It was a mistake. And I think it was a mistake that was born out of ignorance. The Hebrew Jews who were clearly in charge of the daily distribution at this time, as you would expect, because the church begins out of mainly Hebrew Jewry, and those are going to be the natural people that get put in charge of it. They simply didn't know the Hellenist Jewish widows. They didn't know their needs, and they just didn't realize that people were going without. And that's probably because these two groups just were not deeply connected. They were generally connected under the umbrella of Christ. They were connected in weekly worship, but they weren't connected much beyond that. And so there was ignorance about what was needed in that group. And as so happens in the, so often happens in these situations of accidental neglect, uh, that gets read understandably through a lens of suspicion. Uh, Luke tells us that the Hellenists complained. And, and by that, Luke doesn't mean that they wrote a formal complaint. Um, they didn't do what our book of church order tells you to do and says, now comes this day on the year of our Lord. That's what we actually have to do when we file a complaint, which is awesome. Uh, that's not what he means. He means... The Hellenists started to whisper among themselves that they were being overlooked on purpose. It's the same word that's used to describe Israel's grumbling in the desert when they started to whisper among themselves that God wasn't really trustworthy and Moses had actually brought them out into the desert to die. So the situation here is very much like when people get upset, but they don't go and address the problem head on. Instead, they go to their friends or trusted confidants and they say, can you believe what's going on? I think they hate us. You think they hate us? No, I don't think they hate us. But you know what? They don't care much about us. You're right. They don't. We can't trust them. You're right. We can't trust them. Right? And then that conversation spreads. And suspicion becomes anger and anger becomes division and division becomes hatred, animosity, and warfare. That's the issue that's facing the church here in Acts chapter 6, the bridges of love and loyalty and faith that Jesus has been building up in his diverse church are being broken down because of neglect and because of complaining. And that just sounds so modern, doesn't it? I mean, you could walk into any number of churches in America today, and though the names and the groups will be different, you could probably find something very similar going on here. Uh, and as we move on to our next point, I want to leave us with this reminder that these kinds of problems are avoidable if we commit to building relationships with our fellow saints who are not like us. And if we commit to dealing with issues openly 
and with grace and patience. So if we can look at, at the congregation and say, honestly, that person is not someone that I understand very well. Uh, we don't click easily together, but Jesus is calling me to love them. And so while we don't need to be best friends, I do need to be aware of their needs. I need to know their joys and their struggles so that we can have the unity of the spirit that Jesus is calling us to, because without that awareness, unintentional harm. And remember, these widows don't have food. This is real harm. And even though it wasn't intentional, it doesn't mean there wasn't real hurt done and real offense taken. So without a real awareness of one another's needs, people Jesus loves can be hurt, even unintentionally. And then that can breed suspicious whispering, which can very easily spread, which is also why it is vital to practice open communication instead of suspicious whispering. Uh, going to each other openly, asking questions honestly, listening humbly, dealing with issues in a way that invites bridge building rather than inviting bridge destruction that, excuse me, is the way Jesus wants us to deal with these issues. Paul says in Galatians, in one of my favorite verses, watch out. If you keep biting and devouring each other, you will destroy each other. That was the danger here. And so the apostles, they take pretty swift and, and frankly, very impressive action to address both the problems of ignorance and the promise of suspicious, problem of suspicious whispering by getting leaders who are going to be able to help the congregation grow in the way in which they love each other and are aware of each other's needs and also help them develop this skill of, and it's a skill that takes time to learn, how to have opus, honest communication about difficulties and struggles with people who you don't know that you can trust because they're different from you and you don't have a deep relationship with them. And so that brings us to verses two through four. I'm going to read those again. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So summoning the full number of the disciples, which was the entire church, that must have been a pretty amazing sight to see. Again, we're talking about tens of thousands of people. Um, have you ever tried? You, you've all been here for congregational meetings. It can be hard to get the whole congregation here for one congregational meeting. We are not tens of thousands of people, but somehow they did it. It's impressive. I would like that secret. They should write a book. Um, they did write a book. That's the joke. Uh, and, uh, and what the apostles say in this congregational meeting is essentially this. This is a real problem, but it's a long-term problem. And it's not something that we apostles can dedicate our time and resources to solving in the long term. Because if we did that, other things like preaching and teaching the word of God, which is also very important and is a long-term job that God has given to the church, that would end up being neglected. And then that would actually give us a whole new set of problems and actually even bigger problems. And we're going to talk about that more towards the end of the sermon. And so what the apostles say is uh, what's needed for the long haul is help, leadership's help. So out of the tens of thousands of you, we need you to find, we need you to find seven men to become leaders who will oversee the distribution, but not just oversee the distribution. He's not basically asking them for to be an Amazon logistics manager. Uh, we need seven men who can cross this chasm of distrust and help rebuild and strengthen these relational bridges that Jesus wants to create. We need leaders who will help us make peace so that the kingdom of God can continue to grow in our hearts and out into the world, as we've been talking about in Acts. We need leaders who will model and guide the church in both intentional care 
and intentional conflict resolution. In other words, we need peacemakers. How do I know that's part of it? Well, because of the character traits that these seven men need to have. They need to have a good reputation, men of good repute, and they need to be full of the spirit and wisdom. So in this context, having a good reputation must mean that these men were well thought of by everyone. These have to be men that the Hellenists respected and that the Hebrews respected and that the Romans in the church respected and that the widows themselves respected and the slaves and the elderly and the single and the engaged and the newly married and on it goes, right? Now, in order for that to be the case, these men would need to be known then by every group in the church. Not that they would have to be individually known by tens of thousands of people, which I think is impossible, um, but they would have to be known by all the different kinds of people in the church, all the subsets and all the groups, and then all those different kinds of people would need to think well of them in order to meet this criteria of having a good reputation. And already that gives you a clue as to the kinds of people the apostles are looking for, right? They're looking for people who take an interest in the whole church body with all of its diversity. They want people who have already learned how to practically love the people who are like them, what today we call their in-group, right? And people who are different than them, what we today call their out-group. These are people who have learned to love those who are like them and different than them, all the different kinds of people in the church. And that becomes especially evident in the next requirement, that they be full of the Spirit. Now, we've run into this phrase a few times in Acts, and as we've seen, full of the Spirit describes Christians who have adopted a rule of life that organizes their time around Jesus. We've talked about how we see that rule of life in Acts. Weekly su Sunday worship, Sabbath rest, corporate prayer with the church pri body, private prayer, sacrificial hospitality. And who have done this then long enough that their devotional life has clearly affected them. It's transformed the way they think and speak and act. Being full of the Spirit means that the Spirit of God has taught you when to speak, how to speak, what to say, how to listen, what actions to take, what goals to pursue, what's actually important that you have to stand up for, and what's not and can be let go. It also means that you're somebody who regularly prays to God and asks him about all of these things. You're not somebody who says, I have the Spirit, so I get to do whatever I want. It's someone who says, I need the Spirit, and you get on your knees, and you pray, and you ask Jesus for help, and he helps you. And this is important because, uh, and this is why the apostles are looking for this, only the Holy Spirit can grow the kingdom of God. And to be full of the Spirit means that he has matured you into a person who can join him well in that task. To be full of the Spirit means the Spirit regularly partners with you to build his kingdom because of how much he's transformed you. That means then that being full of the Spirit is something that can be prayerfully discerned by the church. What the apostles believed and, and what I think we ought to believe is that the church can actually examine the fruit of someone's words and someone's actions, and we can discern if they've been used by the Holy Spirit to build the church up and grow it in hearts and lives and in the world, or not. Do their words and actions, do they bring real peace, or do they bring division? Do they draw people closer to Jesus and strengthen them to serve his kingdom and follow his way of life? Or do they divert attention from Christ and from his gospel? Do they tear down or do they build up? Do they strengthen bonds or do they weaken bonds? And so the apostles are telling the church to look for seven men who are respected by the entire church because of the way they take an interest in all the different people in the church. And then also look for seven men who have been walking with Jesus long enough and faithfully enough that he has actually changed them and equipped them 
by his spirit to build his kingdom through them. That is to build up love and repentance and forgiveness and thus unity within the body of Christ. See, all the kinds of things that the church needs, if it's to be at peace among itself and to make peace within the world, if it's going to have these relational bridges rebuilt and strengthened. And then finally, these seven men also need to be wise. And here I think the apostles are telling the church uh, that they need seven leaders who will be both able to handle the logistics of the daily distribution, like everything from who gets put on the distribution roll, how much they get, when, where's the food coming from, who's handling it, handing it out. Like that's a big task. They need to have wisdom for how to do that. But also, I think especially, men who have the wisdom necessary to navigate the conflicts that are going to come when you're talking about who gets their daily bread from the church and who doesn't. Find seven men who are able to listen not only to what's being said, but also to what's not being said, who are going to have the wisdom to understand the group dynamics that are at play in this massive 10,000-member body uh, in, in Jerusalem. Find seven leaders who are able to ask good questions and then find godly, gospel-filled, practical ways of strengthening unity and making real peace in the conflicts that are going to arise in this kind of ministry. Now, I know after that list, uh, we might be thinking, it doesn't seem possible to find one of those people, let alone seven, unless that one person is Jesus and he's in heaven. So where are these people going to come from? Uh, but maybe, maybe, Maybe that's because we're assuming that part of wisdom and being filled with the Spirit and having a good reputation means you can't sin or make mistakes. That's a bad assumption. Uh, these things absolutely include the fallen brokenness of God's people. Uh, for the simple fact that you cannot have a good reputation in Jesus' church or be filled with the Spirit who is only given to those who know their sin or be given wisdom but, uh, without owning your sin, without knowing that you are a fallen creature, that you have limitations, limited sight, limited capabilities. All of these gifts are worked out within the brokenness and limitedness of God's people. That's part of what it means to be a leader in Jesus' church. The apostles are not looking for perfect people. They're looking for mature leaders who have learned how to receive Jesus' grace for themselves and stand on his forgiveness so that they can own their own brokenness in front of the congregation and say, when they're challenged, you forgot my aunt. You said a mean word. Oh my goodness, like you're right. I did do that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Let me make it up. That's what it means to own the forgiveness of Jesus, to be able to stand on his own, on his forgiveness for yourself and thus not be afraid of your sin because Jesus has dealt with your sin and then learn how to help other people in terms of conflict resolution stand on the forgiveness of Jesus. Hey, like there's brokenness here. You don't need to justify yourself all the time. You can be honest about your failings and you can forgive because Jesus has forgiven you. That's the kind of leadership that Jesus wants. That's what it looks like to have wisdom and be full of the Spirit and have a good reputation in Jesus' church. The apostles are not looking for perfect leaders. They're looking for mature Christians. And it's on that last point of maturity that I want to bring our sermon to a close with uh, my excellently titled last point, Bridge Expanders. Uh, and, and here I want to focus on why the apostles believed that it was so important for them to devote themselves to prayer and to ministry of the word instead of devoting themselves to the role of seeing the daily distribution of food to widows and orphans. Because God cares about both, right? The church is sinning if we do not care for widows and orphans and the poor and vulnerable in our midst. And we're also sinning if we don't regularly have the presence of God's word and worship in our lives. Why do the disciples say we need to prioritize the word and worship and we need someone else to prioritize uh, the care of widows and orphans. Uh, this is going to be quick. Uh, it's because they knew that the church was not uh, 
that, that if the church was not led in prayer and was not taught regularly from the Bible, the work that these seven leaders were going to enter into and that the whole church was going to enter into, that would ultimately be in vain because these relational bridges being built would never really get the strength they need. They would become weak and fragile, and they would eventually crash down in a, a tragic uh, chaos. Why do I say that? Why do the apostles believe that? Well, here's my question to you. Where did these leaders come from? How were these leaders formed? And how did the church get the ability to discern these leaders in their midst? Did you notice that the apostles said, you pick out the seven men, not us. You find them, we will appoint them. How does the church not only have leaders that are grown in them to be of good repute and full of the spirit and wise, but that the church can actually have the God-given ability to discern that work in these leaders. It was because they were sitting regularly under the ministry of the word and worship and under the ministry of the word and their small group meetings and in their prayer meetings together. It was, it was that that created the context. What was it that also continued to guide them uh, day in and day out as they worked together to make peace and to rebuild these bridges and to strengthen these relation, the relationships. All of this was the product of the apostles' larger discipleship ministry that led the church in their rule of life that we've been looking at for the last couple of months. See, through the ministry of the word in weekly wor worship and in small group meetings and through the ministry of prayer, including not only their own private prayers, but the corporate prayers, the apostles led uh, as a church the apostles ministry created both the context for this whole thing it, it created it created the environment necessary to mature these leaders and to mature the church and to give them all the ability to recognize these leaders and to continue to equip them and to nurture them and to feed them as they follow jesus into the peace of the kingdom of god this right here is what was necessary so that in chapter 11 we could get this brief statement that uh, the Hellenists and the Hebrews in Antioch received the apostles' teaching with great joy, and they, it was there they were first called Christians. This is the context, and it happens underneath the umbrella of the ministry of the word and of prayer. It was the apostles' dedication to their ministry of the word and prayer that made this ministry of nurturing unity in the body taking care of the widows and orphans and the congregation possible. And it was their dedication to that ministry, the apostles' dedication to their ministry, that sustained it. And that's why, in conclusion, uh, if we're going to be a church of peacemakers who have the blessing of our name and Jesus' name being connected in the minds of our neighbors, we need to do four things very quickly. First, we need to make sure that we are connected to people in the church that maybe are not as natural to connect with as some others. We need to make sure that we are intentionally aware of everyone. Not that we have to be best friends with everyone, but we just need to know about each other's life. Hey, how are you this week? How can I pray for you? That's sad. Let me pray for you. I'm, are people feeling better? I noticed so-and-so wasn't here. Are they sick? That's the level that Jesus wants us to be at, at minimum, so that we can grow these relationships. The second thing we need to do is we need to commit to addressing issues openly and graciously, not under suspicion, but simply asking questions or letting people know, hey, like, it hurt my feelings when this got said or when that didn't happen. Did you mean this? Could you help me understand that? Do it in a way that is open and honest with the people that we are actually concerned about, not talking to others about problems we have with other people in the church. Open and gracious communication. We also need spiritually mature leaders who are invested in the thriving of the entire congregation. Uh, and we need to pray that our leaders here, your pastor, elders, and deacons, would continually grow in this and mature in it and be strengthened in it, would be given wisdom to help with it. And then finally, we need to embrace the ministry of word and prayer which Jesus uses to actually produce and sustain these things in us. We need to be at church on Sunday. And uh, I know we have a live stream, and I love a live stream for 
visiting a church you're not used to going to and for if you're shut in or sick but like if you're listening on live stream and you live in the area like come be a part of the congregation come love the people that jesus has here at grace so that you can join us in this great ministry of being peacemakers on earth getting your name and our name together attached to jesus as we grow together in unity we need to prioritize sunday worship we need to prioritize uh, I think our growth group meetings where we get together and we sit under the word so that we can be nurtured and matured in these things. So let's ask Jesus to make all of these things uh, more part of our lives. Let's ask him to strengthen what's here because there's things here that are good that Jesus has built. We need him to strengthen and grow it. And let's ask him also to give us whatever may be lacking in our body and to build us together in his peace so that we can be peacemakers for Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we very much uh, want to enter into the blessing of being peacemakers with your son. And so we ask that you would give us what we need to join him in this great task. Uh, help us to care for each other, even though relationships may not always come naturally. Uh, equip us to address conflicts openly and graciously. Bless our leaders, our elders, our pastor, our deacons with the fullness of your spirit and with an ever-growing love for your people and a, and a deep wisdom about how to lead this congregation in the ways of peace so that the kingdom of God can be built up on our hearts and built out into the world. And finally, Lord, please bless us with a ministry of the word and of prayer that draws us to you and that transforms us into the image of Christ so that we would not only love each other more, but know the love of Christ more and uh, be filled with his joy more. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.